Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Celine Martin, and I will be your host today for this webinar on innovations in viral vector development, scale-up, and production. Our agenda today will cover a broad range of topics and will be followed by a Q&A. During all the talks, you can ask your question in the chat box, and our presenters will review them at the end. During this webinar, we will look at the whole manufacturing workflow from plasmid production to upstream, downstream, and quality controls. On top of some official scientific experts, we are also glad to host the presenter from the industry, Thomas Garinoni from Viragen in Spain, who will present his work on AAV purification. If you'd like to hear more industry case studies, we will also host a full-day workshop on the 27th of February at our Customer Evaluation Center in Darmstadt, located near Frankfurt in Germany. It would be a great opportunity to network with your peers and get more in-depth knowledge about closing the gaps in viral vector manufacturing. First, let me start by introducing Thermo Fisher Scientific. At a glance, our company has a global footprint of 70,000 employees, and no matter what science you're making, we are committed to stay ahead of innovation. Our mission is to enable you to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. And supporting gene therapy developer is a great example of that. Indeed, the use of viral vector to develop therapies is a rapidly growing field, with an increased number of clinical trials worldwide. Um, as these are innovative medicine, the field might not be as established as other um, in the biotechnology industry. And lots of technical solutions have still to be explored to streamline processes. Tackling the manufacturing challenge is just one part of the equation alongside finding the right doses and the safest gene editing tool. For manufacturing, poor yield, tech transfer difficulties, getting robust quality profile, and setting up CGMT capabilities can be challenging. In this webinar, we will address some of these pain points focusing on two broadly used platforms, namely lentiviral vector, or LV, and adeno-associated viral vectors, or AAV. From here on, we will have regular polling questions to get your opinion on how the field is evolving. A pop-up window will appear for each, and we will review your answer before the Q&A. So first, let's think what you think about the main bottlenecks in viral vector manufacturing. Is it A, access to clinical grade plasmid or other raw materials? Is it B, scale up issue? Um, C, DSP yield? D, CDMO slot availability? Or E, others? Thank you again for participating. Don't forget to ask questions in the chat box. And now let's start this webinar with our first presenter, Jason Brown. Thanks for the introduction. This is Jason Brown. I worked for Thermal Fisher of Logan, Utah for the past seven years. In the first few years of that, I helped finalize the design and the development of the single-use fermenter. And I was heavily involved in the developing the exhaust system and then testing the, the system for applications. And since then, I've been working with customers to move the single-use fermenter into their facilities and proof concept and, and help them start up. Um, here in Logan, Utah, we, we, do, we make various single-use bioprocessors systems and containers, such as lab tainers, tubing manifolds, high-performa product line of mixers, powder tainers, bioreactors, fermenters, and, and several other custom vessels and systems of any ideation. So single-use systems are specifically designed and validated to meet the needs and specific functions which, which they're built for. So the, the single-use fermenter really helps customers as they can bring it into their lab and have a quick turnover time after production and move into their next process in, in one hour instead of at one day. And as I said earlier, the, our systems are validated for their specific intended use. They're pre-assembled and they come sterile. And that takes the load off the customer so they can do their own their processing and spend more time in that. Depending on their process, they can a close system using single use. And I don't, I don't have a lot of time, so I'll move through as quickly or than normal. And giving some details on the single use fermenter, it has high performance. Uh, we, we designed it as a single use fermenter, so it, it produces a KLA of 600 per hour, and that's because it has three high shear Russian impellers, four baffles, has an aspect ratio that you expect to see in a fermenter, and has a ring like sparge, unlike several other of these options in the field, which are just reactors that have been moved to fermenters. So yeah, the fermenter also has a 5 to 1 working volume, so you can use it from 6 to 30 liters or 60 up to 300 liters. And it has a high 
flow exhaust system, so it can handle two vessel volumes of gas. That's 60 liters for the 30 liter or 600 for the 300 liter. It has a foam sense and other single use control, which optimizes its use as a fermenter. So now there are, we've done several well, customers have been using this fermenter for the past five years, and many of them have been using it for plasma production. I'm able to share details on the on these information you see on this screen, and specifically we don't have a lot of time, so I'll just talk about the the last one. And if you want to know more about the others, they'll be on thermalfisher.com slash suf. So first, I, I want to talk about this culture we did, these cultures we did with this customer who came to us with um, a need where they needed to take control of their cultures and move from their contract manufacturer to in-house production. So basically, we did a simple tech transfer into the 300 liter stuff because that's the scale they, they were looking at. Um, and then with those results, they took them back to their lab and, and developed a scale down model in their one liter glass vessels. And you can see it's pretty smooth control in the single use fermenter as we're using Delta V and through BIOS gain scheduling, which smooths out the control really nicely. And they were able to, they were very pleased because they had tested other systems before and they had only gotten to ODs of 440. And then coming to us, they were hoping to, to actually achieve at least 80. And so they were very pleased and we outdid their, their expectations, reaching 150 OD and equivalent results for the gram per liter of production. So we then ran that as well in the 30 liter stuff and to show feasibility in that as well for them. And then they, they ended up purchasing the single use fermenter from us. And in their benchtop metal they, model, they could then compare all their other processes that they wanted to move into the system. And they were able to see that their, their other processes for plasma production would also work as well. So here's another slide showing the, the ferment, single use fermenter during the run with them and the true vial G3 light next to it. As I said, this is a improved their yields three folds from what they'd seen before and the single use and improved feasibility. I want to go into a brief amount of details on, on some feedback from other customers who have been using the single single use fermenter. Sorry. So that basically it has great advantages in setup and cleaning. Basically when you're done, you just roll it out and send it to decontamination and continue on to your next step. Preparation of your, your next run is similar in media preparation. The hands-on time of stuff is much shorter and is pretty advantageous. And now, as I'm about out of time, I'm going to skip to the next slide and just kind of show there's, there's a lot more application data online. If you go to thermalfisher.com slash SUF, you can see these other cultures and look up and download um, details about them the ones I shared today, and more about other we'll be uploading this month for plasma production. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jason. And as we see in the middle, this can be used for equalized plasmid production. And from plasmid to viral vector, here is our next polling question. Which type of vectors are you actually interested in? LV, AV, AAV, HSV, gamma retro viruses vector or others like oncolytical viruses. So if you've answered LV at that question, our expert, Ian Pringles, will now take the floor. Thank you, Celine. Uh, as Celine said, my name is Ian Pringle. I'm a field application specialist for cell therapy in uh, Europe. And I'm going to talk to you today about the LV Max production system for the production of lentivial vectors. The LVMAX lentiviral production system is the first optimized lentiviral production system for suspension culture. It can be used to produce high titers of lentivirus in a scalable suspension system. There are no animal drive components in the kit, and a GMP version is available for commercial use. There are four components to the LVMAX system. A uh, HEC293F cell line capable of growing to very high cell densities, a novel transfection reagent capable of highly efficient transfection, an enhancer solution to boost the expression from plasmids, and a media supplement. 
Uh, using design of experiment software, uh, studies were designed to determine the optimal conditions for these four components to work together. And taken together, the results suggest a 20-fold or greater increase in length of arrow yield compared to conventional production systems. If we look at the, the cell line used in the kit is a HEC293 derivative. It does not contain the large SP40T antigen, and a clone was selected that could be used to support the cell growth up to very high cell densities, around 1 times 10 to the 7 cells per mil, but with still very high cell viabilities above 95%. It has a doubling time of around 24 to 26 hours, and typically we see very low aggregation of these cells, even at very high cell densities. And as shown here in this in this graph, different culture vessels can support cell group culture growth in a scalable manner. So we can see predictable cell growth in different volumes of culture. So from a small from a small culture flask, you can predict the type of uh, culture growth you're going to see in a much larger vessel. The scalability of cell growth is useful because it allows the development of production protocols in different experimental formats. So using a standard HIV BSVG vector expressing a GFP transgene, uh, small scale studies could be performed in deep well 96 well plates. And the results from that could be used to identify lead candidates that could be taken forward and verified in larger scales all the way through to uh, large scale flasks and into bioreactors. So for example, uh, there was a requirement when developing the LVMAX uh, kit for a more efficient uh, non viral transfection reagent in order to efficiently transfect multiple plasmids into these high density cells. So cells were seeded in 96 well plates and then multiple transfection reagent formulations were formed with a standard plasmid mix. The Supernatant from those adulting transfections was harvested at 48 hours post-transfection, and the functional vector titer was determined by transducing uh, HT1080 cells. Uh, two days later, the GFP fluorescence was used to determine a functional titer in transducing units per mil, as shown here. And from this data, you can see that the, the transfection formulations that resulted in the highest titers were taken forward and used at larger scales to, to pick the uh, transfection agent used in the kit. And the control formulation here, I think, is, uh, is lithovectamine 3000, our standard offering for adherent cells. You can see a massive increase in production of vectors that, uh, with uh, novel formulations. A similar approach was taken when designing an enhancer formulation. If you've made lentivirus with another system, uh, then you will probably be used to using sodium butyrate as a histone deacetylase inhibitor to boost expression from plasmids. Uh, for LBMAX, our team wanted something uh, better than that. So again, using the same small scale system, transfections were set up, and then, then the effects of multiple different enhanced formulations on vector titer uh, were determined. And again, relative to the control, which is uh, sodium butyrate, uh, you can see large increases in, in vector titer were uh, determined, were found, and then again those candidates were taken forward. In addition to having established the optimal enhancer formulation itself, uh, we then um, conducted time course studies to determine the optimal uh, time point for enhancer addition. So enhancer was added at various time points post transfection and it was found that adding the enhancer at any time point resulted in an increase in lentivirus production. But we suggest, um, uh, for our kit, for our standard offering, we suggest adding it between 5 and 14 hours post-transfection. Although, in truth, for custom formulations, this is something that I would recommend that people go back and optimize for themselves, because different plasmas will behave differently to uh, the enhancer. So, in that kind of manner, the protocol was built and we end up with a complete protocol for lentivirus production using LVMAX. The cells are prepared on day zero in fresh media at 3.5 and 10 to 6 cells per mil. And then 18 to 24 hours later, they are diluted back to the transfection um, density of 4 times 10 to 6 cells per mil. 
and the LVMAX supplement is added. And the role of the supplement is to uh, prevent or slow down cell division. The idea being that if cells aren't expending energy on cell division, then they can be they have more opportunity to produce more vector, and that certainly seems to help. Transfection mix is created and added to the cells with the enhance enhancer added five to 14 hours later, as I said. And then the optimal time point for harvest, um, again, should be established for each product. But generally, it seems to fall between 48 and 55 hours post-transfection. Uh, post After that, users will go on and determine um, the titer of the vector. Uh, in the kit, we recommend a GFP-based protocol but obviously for non for, for real vectors, a custom method will have to be developed. A question that we often get asked is, do we have to use the complete system? A lot of people in particular want to use the cells and the media from LVMAX, but perhaps use um, PEI or sodium butyrate as a transfection mix. Our R&D team have uh, considered this and have tried many different reagent swapping experiments. Consistently, the highest titers that we see are when the complete lentivirus LVMAX system is used, and that is our recommend recommendation. Yes, obviously other combinations do work, but when you consider that all these processes will have similar hands-on time and similar plasmid costs, and uh, the, then the higher titers from LVMAX make it actually economically a, a, a very nice way to produce vector regardless of the scale you're working at. In addition to the research use only kit, we have the cell therapy systems or CTS LVMAX available. This uh, has got the, the, the viral production cells, the media, the transfection kit, and CTS OptumM. It's regulatory, these are regulatory, requirement, regulatory compliant reagents produced in conformity with the uh, GMP for medical devices, 21 CFR compliant, and where appropriate, we have a drug master file or regulatory support, support available on request. The CTS and the research use only uh, versions have identical protocols. So this presents a single platform here that you can use from early stage work in, in a very small uh, culture vessel, all the way through to your process development, tech transfer, and then long-term into clinical use. And we have uh, ongoing R&D work uh, to develop protocols for use in large-scale bioreactors, although some of our customers are already doing this independently. In terms of support, uh, I'm a field application scientist, and uh, our field applications team are here to, are here to uh, help you implement LVMAX into your lab. If you're new to suspension culture or new to lentivirus, then uh, we can help you with protocols, going through them in more detail. And we can give advice on what consumables you need to get. Or again, if you're new to suspension culture, then we can give advice on what sort of equipment you need to do uh, suspension culture. So in summary, the LVMAX system is a very cost-effective way to make lentivirus relative to adherent or other suspension-based processes. It can generate very high titers of lentivirus, uh, suitable for downstream processing and purification. It's a scalable suspension-based system, which has its own benefits over uh, adherent uh, production. Completely animal-free, with no human or animal components. And we have a CTS version available for clinical use. So, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Ian. Um, as you are now used to it, our next question here is actually to get your opinion on what would be the most pertinent cell line for the future of our vector. Would it be HEC293, as um, Ian presented, SF9, BHK, Herle, um, HE549, other cell line, or cell-free systems? Most of the cells can be culture in suspension, and if you're already at the stage to scale up, our next presenter is Floris Ohinga. Thank you, Celine, for the introduction. In the next 10 minutes or so, I would like to tell you a bit more about our next generation bandstop controllers and the single-use bioreactors. When choosing a bandstop bioreactor system for your process, there are several topics to think about, which are often forgotten. Unknown future developments. You are still developing your process, so often you don't know yet how the future scale-up will look like. Scattered data storage. 
When data is siloed and fragmented, you need extra time to manually adjust that. This also increases the chances of mistakes. Different user interfaces. An interface what seems to work well for a development environment could be not so useful for production later on. This can result in tech transfer concerns. Different user interfaces, data is not easily transferable, which can result in project delays or even worse, in project failure. This shows that there are a lot of topics to keep in mind when deciding to acquire a benchtop bioreactor system. What does Thermo Fisher offer to overcome these challenges? Provide flexibility across platform and scale. We offer one hardware and software platform from process development to CGMP commercial production. Open architecture for both hardware and the single use bioprocess containers. Integration of third party is also no problem. Enable seamless data flow into Delta V distributed control system. With this, we offer a hardware and software build for all skills and is designed to support your process transfer. Standardization of user interface. With our own proprietary through bio software, we can offer an off-the-shelf software package that is easy to use from development up to full production using the power of Delta V. With all this thermoscientific bioprocessing equipment and automation solution, reduce the complexity involved in scale-up and technology transfer. Thermoscientific offers bioreactors and controllers in a wide range, from less than a liter up to 2,000 liters, which all run on a true bio software powered by Delta V. In the following two slides, I want to focus on our band scale offering for process development. For band scale processes, we offer a thermoscientific high-performer T3 lab controller. This is a unique controller as it can control different types and brands of vessels. We have our own thermoscientific high performer glass bioreactor, but we also have multiple customers who had the preference of using third party glass vessels. This is no issue for our G3 lab controller. Additionally, we see that the use of single use bioreactors for band scale processes is increasing. Also, these third party vessels can be run with our G3 lab controller. Not shown on the slides are our rocker bioreactors. Also, those can be run with our G3 lab controller. This shows the flexibility of our G3 lab controller, which gives you the flexibility to switch between types of vessel without having to buy different controllers and getting used to different user interfaces. For our band scale G3 lab controller, we offer true biodiscovery bioprocess control software to non-GMP laboratories. This provides benefits of the Delta V platform without the high upfront investment and unnecessary complexity of large scale and GMP networks. This is done by using only a workstation-based control without the physical Delta V controller. With True Bio Discovery and the G3 Lab controller, you can use glass, single use, and rocker bioreactor systems with a single control software. The software allows scientists to easily transfer data during tech transfer. As for large scale, also the True Bio control software is used. Because of our open architecture approach, it enables our controllers to integrate with existing third-party vessels. As through biodiscovery is only a workstation-based control, it reduces the amount of band space required in your process development lab. For the next couple of minutes, I would like to tell you a bit more about our next generation single-use bioreactors for large scale. These systems are mostly used in a clinical or commercial environment. Most of you might be already familiar with our thermoscientific high-performance single-use bioreactors, also called SUBS as these have been on the market now for approximately 15 years. The high performance sub is available in a range from 50 liter up to 2000 liter and has a turndown ratio of five to one. This high turndown ratio helps to reduce the number of steps in the C train. All our subs have direct drive motor. So the actual RPM the motor spins is the actual RPM you get in your bioreactor. This is not always the case when using magnetic coupling as slippage can occur. We have an open architecture approach for both hardware and single-use bioprocess containers. This gives you as a user the capability to get the solution that best matches your process needs. As, in, as suspension culture is most commonly used in third bioreactors, like for example HEC cells for viral vector production, we also have developed steps for application-specific needs like fat beds, perfusion, or adherent cell culture processes. Application-specific processes require specific needs like for perfusion and fat bed processes, more mixing power and more mass transfer is required. Specifically nowadays when cell densities keep increasing. For adherent cell cultures, when using for example microcares, higher 
Mixing powers is needed to prevent settling of the carriers. But low tip speed and preventing small eddy lengths are key to make sure cells are less likely to be shared of the microcarriers. This slide shows the changes made to our high performance sub for application specific needs. The left vessel you see is our legacy 2 to 1 turn down ratio sub. Later, we developed our high performance sub 5 to 1 turn down ratio. What have we done to facilitate the application specific process in our high performance sub? Upsized impeller. This is increasing the power input significantly compared to the standard impeller size. Enhanced drill hole sparger. For perfusion and fat batch processes, substantial mass transfer increases were not only obtained by upscaling the impeller and increasing the agitation, but also by altering the sparging system in the sub. Bubble sizes were reduced by reducing the drill hole sparger pore size, effectively increasing the surface of area of mass transfer. At the same time, the DH pore quantities were increased to maximize the gas flux area. If you're interested in more detail about these enhanced subs, Thermo Fisher has a white paper which explains it in more detail. To summarize what the main changes are for enhanced subs for application-specific processes, increased impeller size. This increases power input up to 100 watts per cubic meter. Enhanced drill hole sparge for perfusion and fat beds, resulting in a two to four times KLA improvement. The industry is evolving as requirements change. Thermo Fisher wants to help customers to keep fulfilling these future demands. Therefore, there is a need for a next generation sub. New or existing future development requirements are intensified cultures. This requires even further improvement, mixing and mass transfer performance. Flexible multi product facility. This requires flexible, scalable, and space efficient subs. Increasing demand for single use capacity. This requires large, polymetric, more efficient single use bioreactors. Therefore, Thermo Fisher has developed the Thermo Scientific High Performance Dynadrive Bioreactor. Key for this new bioreactor is to obtain performance and to be ready for the future. We want to be able to give our customers best in class performance, which we do with power per volume up to 80 watts per cubic meter, KLA performance up to 40 per hour, and a turn down ratio of at least 10 to 1. Efficient facility footprint. The Dynadrive 3000 liter and 5000 liter have the same footprint as our current. 2,000 liter sub. Due to the higher turndown ratio, shorter seat trains can be used. The bioprocess container for the Dynadrive will be available in our well-known, robust, and reliable Thermo Fisher Aegis 514 film. The collapsible drive frame makes the bioprocess container compact for transport and easy to install. This slide highlights some of the performance improvements, but if you are interested in more information about the Dynadrive, feel free to reach out to us. And with that, I would like to conclude my presentation with the following points. By choosing for Thermo Fisher, you have solutions from band scale to production scale, one platform from development to commercial production, open architecture to fit your process needs, future proof by providing best in class products for a new and future requirements. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Floris. Now that we have gone through the upstream steps, let's now talk about DSP. So our putting question for this one is, what are your preferred techniques to purify viral vectors? Is it A, ultrasensification, B, affinity chromatography, C, ion exchange or hydrophobic interaction resins, the combination of ultrafiltration, ultrasensification and chromatography, or E, combination of multiple types of chromatography? All right. So, without further ado, on chromatography, welcome Zoltan Gullius and Thomas Garinoni. Thank you, Celine. Indeed, Thomas and I will present the purification segment together. I will start with introducing our affinity solutions for biovectors, then I will hand it over to Thomas to introduce the workflow for AAB purification at Virogen and explain a case study. In order to create affinity solutions for biorectors, we have combined the unique ligands provided by our Capture Select team with the polymeric backbone provided by our Poros team. Once these unique heavy chain only IGs are created by immunization of LAMAs, the VAJ fragments with the right specificity are conjugated with solid support, which can be agarose or porous. The porous beads are much more suitable for these large biovectors because their rigidity enables high flow rates and their wide core structure ensures high dynamic binding capacities. 
All capture select ligands are produced in yeast without animal derived components, and we are producing ligands in thousands of liter scale to support phase three clinical trials and commercial scale bioproductions as well. We have CGMP compliant solutions on the top four recommended proteins, MOCO antibodies, and viral vectors. The research use only products are also available off the shelf and can be upgraded to CGMP grade if there is interest from your end. Finally, we are actively developing affinity solutions for the listed targets below. I will explain our AV resins on the next slide. Therefore, I want to highlight our solutions for adenovirus 5, which is readily available, and the prototype for baculovirus and influenza can be tested right away. We are progressing the lentivirus and exosome projects as much as we can because we know the field is very much waiting for them. All porous capture select AV resins provide high specificity and product purity, high capacity thanks to the porous backbone and excellent scalability. We created the dedicated AV 8 and 9 resins by customer collaborations and made them readily available afterwards. In the past years, however, the gene therapy field was catching up rapidly, selecting AV as one of the most common viral vector of choice, thanks to their broad tropism and low immunogenicity. Our customers wanted to have a platform affinity capture step, ideally for all serotypes, similarly how protein A works for MOGA antibodies. To fulfill these requests, we created the AVX resin, which has high binding capacity for all standard serotypes and most of the engineered capsids confirmed by numerous customers all over the world. The capacity is serotype and process dependent, of course, but is around the 1E14 and 1E15 VG per mil range. All three resins are fully CGMP compliant, and we can support them with regulatory support file or package and leakage ELISA kits for leach ligand detection. And with this, I would like to thank you for the attention and hand it over to our guest, Thomas, to present his slide. Thank you, Zoltan. Um, yeah, I'm actually really glad to present um, through this Thermo, Thermo Fisher seminar. Um, actually, the collaboration we have in between Thermo and Valgen um, is really great. Um, the company I belong to and for whom I'm actually presenting is Valgen. We are a CMO dedicated to AV manufacturing from preclinical to GMP manufacturing. And I tried to highlight how the collaboration in between Valgen and Thermo, and especially with the Poros Capture Select matrix, has been um, a great advantage for us and I think for the field of um, AV purification. Let's start by like kind of an historical review. Um, so let's say that in the past, uh, recombinant AV have been purified by diverse um, techniques and one of the main one and the um, Oldest one is the double cesium uh, ultra centrifugation gradient, um, which was actually done mainly on um, adherent cells um, that were most probably um, cultured with uh, serum media on um, multi-plate and so on. So not the easiest way. And I think the purification method of um, cesium chloride is still quite used in academic research and leads to quite um, pure vector and functional vectors. Um, however, it's not a really scalable um, technique. In 2016, um, Josh Grieger and Jude Samolsky published um, a process to purify AEV from 20 liters suspended cell um, culture, free of serum um, that they call the protein and um, they were, it was composed of centrifugation to, to pellet the cells, benzene step and ion exchange, and of course, uh, yadic channel ultra centrifugation gradient. Um, this kind of process were leading to, to some issue in terms of scale up and the need of evolution and of process improvement was um, obviously highlighted, not not by me, but by, by some specialists in the field like uh, Eduardo Ayuso, for instance, who was uh, pointing out the need of um, some process that would be completely scalable and maybe enabling GMP AV manufacturing. So you can see clearly a gap in the need of um, the, the process mentioned above because it's going to be really complicated to 
to purify a 200 liters bioreactor, for instance, starting by um, centrifuge and uh, sonication, or even by sodium, sodium chloride ultra centrifugation gradients, it's like kind of an impossibility. So um, the the launch of um, affinity matrix, such as poros capture select on the market, um, completely changed the game and enabled the field to move away from from a platform that was kind of complicated and difficult to scale up to kind of a platform that is almost applicable to all serotypes and, and saving the field a lot of pain in terms of process development. So at Virogen, um, we promote and I've always been um, kind of partisan of a platform that enable a purification from preclinical to DMP manufacturing with the same process. And that's why we apply here at Valogen. So we we have a cell culture that is in cell suspend, suspended cell um, from two to two hundred liter in a, in a defined culture media um, without serum. And we start by lysing um, those cells with a chemical lysis um, to clarify them and to load them on an affinity chromatography, which is um, actually porous capture AVX uh, resin. Um, this resin enables us to be really versatile from different serotype and actually to have a really high concentration factor from cell culture to, to affinity pool. Um, the thing is that after this high concentration factor, we apply a iodic channel density gradient in order to segregate through from empty particles. And then to polish uh, this product, we pass through an anion exchange chromatography, which is again an anion exchange porous 50 HQ resin. Um, we then formulate a formulator product using dialysis or TFF, and and filter it sterilely to through a 0.2 micron uh, filter to in order to fill it afterwards. Um, the output of that is really pure and unrich. Um, particles in, in full particle vector. I'll try to show you some examples of uh, platform purification right now and try to be a bit of more on numbers and try to explain the platform we actually developed um, using thermos resins. Um, it's, it's the example of an AV9 purification scale up, so from 2 liters to 250 liters. Um, a customer project where it was asking us to produce an AV9 um, so, for instance, you can see in the clarified laser that we have some yields from 3.24 e to the 14 to 3.66 e to the 14 VG per liters uh, from 2 to 250 liters. And the final production per liter of cell culture was also around 1 e14 per liter of cell culture. Um, you can see some chromatograms down. Um, down of the slide, I'm not sure that there is a lot of interest looking at that, but you can see that the condition we are are generally um, a loading of around 125 CV, a residence time of 2.8 minutes, but this resin is such, let's say, capacitive that we even reduce the, the residence time to one minute and have no loss in the flow through um, of AEV. Um, the elution is also worked, I mean, works pretty well, and we have an addition in citrate buffer at pH 3 with additives. Obviously, there is some other steps of wash in order to remove more um, contaminants and so on, but this is basically based on uh, every personal work that you probably have to do. Um, you can see on the top right an SDS stainless steel um, of the um, of the AEV. So on, on the well number three, for instance, this is just the product after um, elution of the affinity resin. So you already have a really pure product and you can see on slide well number five, um, the non-retained part of the, of the flow through. It's important to notice maybe that on the well number two, um, you can see the standard, uh, the yeah, standard material from ATCC, which was produced by uh, Philippe Mouillet and Richard Snyder, um, these samples are completely available in ATCC and it's, I think it's a great uh, improvement for the field as well to get some standards uh, available on the market. 
we also have a really good recovery on, on that serotype. It's true that it's not always the case with other serotypes, like serotype 6 might have some more difficulty to, to be recovered on, on capture select IVX, but most of the time we have really good um, recovery and yield with that resin. Um, as explained before, we then concentrate our product from, let's say, 250 liters to 1.5 to 2 liters. And those 2 liters is something that we are able to process doing a iodic sanol ultra centrifugation gradient in order to separate um, full particles from empty particles. As you can see on the left, it's not like a standard ultra centrifugation with faster pipette that we do. But we worked a bit on it to have multi-canal pumps um, in order to load the gradient a bit more automatically and so on. It's still a really manual technique, obviously, but it's enabling us to have a really powerful separation from full from full to empty vectors. Um, you can see once the gradient is built that there is a slight difference in terms of density at the medium size of the of the tubes. And we generally characterize those two by fractioning, fractionating them from, from the bottom in order to see where are our full vector, where are the empties, are they properly segregated in the gradient, and so on. Um, these steps is enable us to, to get a quite um, full particles in an average of 75% full particles, and with a yield that generally change to 50 to 70%. Um, we then charge the product obtained from that ultra centrifugation to a porous HQ50 resin, and we do a bind dilute mode in order to polish the, this product. Um, this step is intended to mainly remove the iodic sanol, concentrate the product, and polish it. And as you can see, we load from, let's say, around 55 CV. And we obtain a quite concentrated product with a quite single peak um, of really concentrated product. The optimal charge that we worked on um, is around 1.5 E14 VG per milliliters of resin. Um, I'm not saying that this is the optimal for everyone. The resin is much more capacitive than that. But um, if you charge it more than this, you might, um, you might face some precipitation in the elution. It's really particular to our process because we do a bind and elute and then the elution, the elution of this product might be like over concentrated regarding to what um, people are going to need on the market. But that's why it's important as well to check those late fractions or those late product, production um, from turbidity on vector um, size by DLS or HPLC or whatsoever. And it's important to notice as well that uh, we have we observe no loss in the non-retained fraction. In conclusion, um, I would say that the porous capture select the um, AVX, but let's say that Thermo Fisher has always been kind of a pioneer in terms of um, affinity resins in the um, gen therapy field um, from AV8 or AV9. But porous capture select X um, enables us to move to a really versatile platform. I think that it's quite kind of really helping the field to move forward in order to reduce the, the time of development um, from, from a process for producing AEV. Um, it's enabling us as well to move from, from a platform that is similar from R&D um, to GMP, having less um, loss in this um, pathway from preclinical to clinical. Um, I also need to mention that the full enrichment of particle by ultra centrifugation gradient is not always the, the best solution. And right now people and a lot of people, there's a lot of application nodes coming for a segregation from full to empty with um, chromatographic approach, for instance, even with porous uh, 50HQ resin. Um, this is not our platform. We, as a CMO, what we want to promote is a rapid um, and, and quick um, transition from preclinical to clinical uh, manufacturing and therefore uh, being able to take a vector and bring it quickly to clinic, um, having a, a robust platform with a full unrich vector. Um, with that, I thanks.
Temo again for giving me the opportunity to talk and let you go in for the next slide. Thank you, Thomas and Zoltan. Uh, we are now coming up at the end of the process and this webinar. So during production, assays are key. And actually, our polling question is, um, what would you like to have as a better solution um, in terms of assay? Would it be A, reliable quantitation, B, residual DNA, C, residual protein, D, residual chemical, E, um, better uh, measurement for empty full capsid, or others? So now, let's hear about our pharma analytics specialist, Rob Osborne. Thank you very much, Celine. Um, my name is Rob. I'm a technical sales specialist uh, within the bioproduction division at Thermo Fisher Scientific. And for the next 10 minutes or so, I'd like to introduce to you at a very high level um, some of the solutions that we have for contaminant and impurity testing within um, a biomanufacturing environment, and more specifically, uh, focus a little more on our solution for residual host cell DNA consultation. So at a high level, just to introduce you to all of the solutions that we can provide, um, we provide a range of assays based on two separate technologies. The first of which is DNA sequencing, um, for which we use our MicroSeq ID platform for microbial identification used in environmental monitoring. Next to that, we have our qPCR platform. And here we have a, a range of assays that I would say are more um, involved in process monitoring for specific contaminants impurities. So we have solutions for the rapid detection of viruses and mycoplasma as contaminants. And we also have solutions for the rapid quantification of typical host cell impurities, specifically host cell protein, uh, residual DNA, and we also have a solution for leached protein A, uh, rapid quantitation. But for the remainder of this presentation, I'm going to concentrate a little bit more on our solution for DNA quantitation. Why is it important to monitor for these residual impurities? Biological products produced within a uh, cell culture contain specific impurities that relate to the host cell and DNA and, and host cell proteins. And the presence of these impurities can have an effect on both the shelf life and the efficacy of a final drug product. And so as a, as a result of that, there are regulatory guidelines that need to be met uh, relating to the amount of these impurities in, in, in a, a biological product. Where would we look to test for these impurities during the manufacturing of a biologics material? Obviously, we look to the uh, final product, um, but as we move further upstream, we'd also be taking samples from as early as uh, the harvesting and cell removal stages. But I would say more predominantly, we're using these assays to monitor host cell impurities throughout the purification downstream stages. Um, and that can be used for both in-process control of a downstream purification process and for a final lot release. So our solution for this is the ResDNA Seq asset, which is a comprehensive full workflow solution, including highly optimized sample prep to cope with a variety of different sample matrices and types coming from the, the various sampling points I described in the previous slides. It's an assay that's been designed with very high sensitivity in mind. Um, we can achieve from test samples 1.5 picogram per mil uh, from a mammalian DNA and up to 15, as low as 15 picogram per mil uh, for microbial DNA. And we've also designed this assay to be highly specific so that we don't see any qPCR cross-reactivity with, with any unrelated DNA from the, the target DNA. And this assay is a rapid testing assay. It's a rapid testing method. Um, so from the point of sampling to achieving um, useful, usable data, 
uh, we've designed the, the whole workflow to be uh, achievable within a less than five hour time frame. And that with very high uh, reliable performance and high consistency, kit to kit, lot to lot. What does the workflow itself look like? Um, as I explained in the previous slide, we provide a full workflow solution. So that includes our prep seek chemistry for the sample prep, the nucleic acid extraction and recovery. And we provide that with both manual and automated workflows. We have the ResDNA seek qPCR kit itself. Um, and that is um, a qPCR assay for which we have a recommended platform. We have our Quant Studio 5 instrument, and we recommend that platform because that's where we've done all of our um, testing and R&D work on these kits. And also, it's compatible with our AccuSeq software, which is really tailored for these kits in terms of um, qPCR workflow, data acquisition, analysis, and reporting out. And this software also enables you to meet all of the regulatory requirements, for example, 21 CFR Part 11 compliance, and all of your data integrity uh, requirements that need to be met. The ResDNA seq assay itself is quite extensive. We have kits covering the majority of host cell lines that would be commonly used within a biopharmaceutical manufacturing environment, both mammalian and uh, microbial. And I want to a little bit now concentrate on the most recent addition to the um, portfolio and the most relevant to this webinar, which is our new HEC-293 residual DNA kit. So if we take a look at the specifications of the kit in terms of its performance, um, we've designed this kit to be able to not only meet, but exceed uh, all of the guideline requirements that would come from um, the, the majority of the, the regulators. And we can meet all of those specifications across a variety of different sample matrices. And indeed, we, we've tested that in typical sample matrices from a, a gene therapy workflow. Um, from the harvesting step right the way through the chromatography process uh, and after final purification of such a sample. So we can achieve uh, these specifications even in the presence uh, of a variety of um, chemical entities that, that, that would be there as a, as a potential interference. So this is showing the, um, the robustness of the assay and the quality of the assay across a variety of different um, matrices um, some of which could be quite a, quite a challenge. I've mentioned about it being a, a whole workflow solution, and prior to the actual qPCR analysis itself, it's very important to have uh, an optimized and robust sample preparation method. And we have that with our uh, PrepSeq chemistry. And these PrepSeq chemistry kits for the sample preparation are uniform across our entire range of assays based on uh, qPCR and, and nucleic acid amplification. So not only for our ResDNA-seq assay, but also for our, our mycoplasma and virus detection assays. It's a magnetic bead-based workflow, which lends itself very well not only to a manual-based workflow, but allows for easy automation, um, which enables you to have um, many capabilities in terms of uh, throughput uh, and your sample throughput requirements. And in that respect, we have a, a number of solutions also for automating, depending upon uh, the number of samples that you may be looking to process. So we have protocols for manual extraction, uh, where you can typically achieve up to 16 extractions per day. We then have what we would describe as our medium throughput solution with the Automate Express, and this will allow you to achieve up to 52 extractions per day. The advantage here is that this then is also in a fully enclosed, fully automated uh, workflow. And at the higher end, for higher throughput requirements, we have our Kingfisher Flex instrument, which will allow up to 192 extractions per day in what we would term a, a semi-automated way. Uh, and what I mean by that is that during that 
Kingfisher Flex workflow, there is a, a single pipetting step halfway through. But as you can see, we have a, a, a range of different PrepSeq extraction solutions depending on, on the, the specific your throughput requirement. I just wanted to also show the efficiency and the robustness of this PrepSeq extraction method prior to, to QPCR. So what we're seeing here in this slide is the recoveries um, as a percentage across a range of different sample matrices, one to five, that are detailed in the table at the below of the slide, at the, the, the bottom of the slide here, and across a range of um, DNA concentrations from those samples. So we have a range of concentrations across a range of sample matrices, and we also have two sets of results um, per sample. The first would be a high molecular weight DNA sample, but then also a DNA exposed to um, some enzymatic degradation to provide a lower molecular weight DNA sample. And across all of these different matrices, concentrations, and differing molecular weights, you can see that we get very high, consistent, good results uh, of nucleic acid extraction when using our PrepSe kits prior to uh, QPCR analysis. And so just to conclude, um, what we can offer here, um, we have commercially available all-inclusive kits containing all of the relevant standards and reagents required to perform the QPCR analysis. We have an optimized sample prep solution with high consistency across a large range of different sample matrices. The QPCR kits themselves offer very high sensitivity and very high specificity to provide you with the utmost confidence in the results and you, the utmost confidence that you're going to meet the requirements set out by the regulators. And those kits will provide you with the highest level of consistency in terms of performance kit to kit, lot to lot, uh, on an ongoing basis. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and uh, I would welcome any questions. Thank you, Rob, and thank you to all our presenters and attendees for their question and answers to the poll. As you've heard, some official scientific goal is to develop flexible solutions for all parts of the viral vector process step. Let's now review together your opinion on the state and future of the field. So, um, in terms of results for our poll, on major bottlenecks, our audience today is focused on fixing issues with scale-up and DSP yield. On vector type, the two major platforms of interest uh, to the audience is LV followed closely by AAV. Logically, the cell line of choice um, is HEC293 cells by a large majority. If we go to preferred purification process, this is a very mixed poll. But chromatography resin, in combination or not, seem to be the preferred um, way of purifying. And finally, on assay improvements, empty full capsid and tighter measurements seem to be the main pain point for the field. I thank you all for your input. On a final note uh, before the Q&A, I'd like to remind you, if you want to hear more scientific and technical details, you can enjoy our one-day workshop on the 27th of February in Germany. You can register your interest at thermofisher.com slash knowledge culture. It will be an opportunity to network with other gene therapy developers and meet our experts face-to-face. -face. Now, um, we'll go through a couple um, of the Q&A questions. Um, Rob, can you enter this question? Is it possible to use other QPC equipment than the um, than time officials for your residual DNA assay? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, yes, it is possible. Um, so the the QPCR platform I mentioned in the presentation is the Quant Studio Five, and this, along with our slightly older 7500 Fast platform are the recommended instruments because that's where we've done most of our 
testing and, and R&D work and because of their compatibility with the AccuSeq software. But it, it is, of course, possible to use um, the assay I detailed and any of the assays that, that were mentioned in the presentation on any qPCR platform. Thank you, Rob. Um, then a uh, second question and last because our time is up. Ian, can you answer this question? Um, is it possible to use your LV kit to produce AAV? Yeah, hi, Suwin. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah. Uh, we're developing a suspension-based system for AAV. Uh, kind of independent of LV Max, but it's not available yet. Um, we do have some guidelines uh, on how to, it, it, basically it can be done. Uh, we, there are customers certainly who are doing it, and we do have some guidelines that if customers want to make a lot of AV quickly, uh, they should t contact us and we can talk them through the process of making AV with LV Max. So it's not something that's widely available, but it can be done. Okay, perfect. Um, well, as we have uh, run slightly over time, um, we will reach out to you individually to answer any pending question. Um, I wish you all a very good rest, rest of the day, and I hope that this uh, webinar was um, informative to all of you. Thank you very much.